Okay, welcome everybody to our Monday night meeting. Um, we're a week off because of some issues with uh, our state legislator setting the tax rate, but here we are on Monday, July 8th. I call the meeting to order. Uh, first thing to do would be to approve the agenda. Uh, are there any additional ads or yeah, requests? Uh so I'd like to add uh, two quick things. One is to review the special event permit for the car show, uh, which will be in August. And then I would like to give a very brief and quick update about Main Street. Main Street projects. Yeah, that's good. Both under manager items. Yeah. Make a motion to approve the agenda with those changes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. No further discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Content, consent agenda items are just the minutes of June 17th meeting. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. I'll second. Okay, very good. Um, all those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Public? Other than Steve and Ann, there isn't any public. <laughs> so we're going to jump ahead. Uh, and this must be your item, Steve, huh? To authorize a contract yes. for the GBA architecture and planning for the community center feasibility study. Okay, very good. Might be a little glitch in that. <laughs> we don't have okay. the first Try to be ahead of the curve here. <clears throat> I think I am. Okay, good. So um, this is a project that um, we discussed before, the Community Center Feasibility Study, as you'll recall. Uh, it's funded with a Community Development Block Grant, a $35,000 grant. We have. Um, cash match that's uh, about $6,250. We have some in-kind match. Um, it's really, just in terms of introduction, uh, it's purely a feasibility study at this point. Uh, the partners in the project are uh, Town Water Area Recreation Program, the senior citizens, uh, the children's room up at uh, Thatcherburg Primary School, those are the main partners, and Revitalizing Waterbury. This grew out of a uh, a planning summit back in January of 2018. Uh, a number of different um, tables at that summit uh, came up with this idea kind of simultaneously. So we thought it would be a good idea to take a look at it. And um, so we put out a request for, for proposals back in April. <coughs> we advertised it um, a couple times in the Times Argus. We sent it to a consultant list from the Department of Housing Community Affairs. We sent it to um, a few different consultants that had expressed interest in this project when they caught wind of it. Uh, we got three good, solid proposals from three different firms. Um, they were uh, GBA Architecture and Planning, that's uh, Gosling Spockman Architects. They've um, changed their name because they've expanded. They have another uh, partner and a staff, so they're GBA Architecture and Planning in Montpelier. Uh, then Redloaf Architects, uh, Planners and Builders out of Middlebury. Um, you may be familiar with their work. Uh, they've done a lot, work, a lot of work for the town of Middlebury, for the college all over the state, um, and, and uh, Northern New England and New York State. And then the third firm uh, is a firm out of Boston. Uh, it's called Bargeman, Hendry, and Archetype Incorporated. They're an architecture firm. They've done a lot of um, I, I should say a lot of recreation centers in Massachusetts, primarily. Uh, they've done a minimal amount of work in Vermont, but um, they're a very qualified firm. So we have um, a committee that um, we got together to evaluate these proposals. Uh, we had uh, Naomi Alfini, who's the executive director of the Children's Room. Uh, we sent them to um, the um, President, and, um, or 
I guess the board chair, I should say, and vice chair for the senior center, and um, they were uh, too busy to evaluate it, but we sent them to, the, to them for review. Karen, um, Karen was revitalizing Waterbury, and then uh, Nick Nadu is um, the prime staff along with me. Barb Farr was involved as well, and, and Bill. So we decided to interview the two Vermont firms. They were actually the top two picks when we evaluated the proposals. Uh, so we held the um, interviews about, um, um, it's about a week and a half ago, and uh, both firms were quite well qualified. Uh, we felt very well qualified. Um, we, Bill and I especially liked the uh, GBA architecture and um, they just, I think the, um, we just felt that they were more uh, engaged, that they were coming with an open mind, that they were willing to listen to what people had to say, whether it was positive or negative. Um, they've done a lot of work for the city of Montpelier. They've done, uh, they're doing a feasibility study on their recreation center right now, which needs re rehabilitation. They've worked on their senior center, they did the transit center that's under construction. So um, we're recommending that we contract with uh, GBA architecture and planning. The group came to a consensus after discussion. Did you want to add anything, Bill? Well, I just wanted to say that um, in the RFP, Steve basically shared the budget. There was no secret, it's not a huge budget. Um, it's mainly grant funded. So. All three entities were, were basically speaking to the same budget. I think that from the interview, and that was where I was most involved, uh, as Steve said, GBA really kind of, I, I think, came to a different level than Breadloaf with their, uh, what seemed their ability to connect with the community and, and listen to what's going on. They have a very collaborative process in their in their shop. Everybody who works in the shop works on all projects. Uh, there's a project manager, of course, but um, you know they they work on it in a very open, uh, <clears throat> collaborative setting. I felt that Breadloaf was much more structured and much more kind of silo oriented. And uh, you know, Breadloaf's a great firm. I have some experience with them. They did a lot of work at the state complex way back in the in the 90s. Uh, they may have built, uh, designed the women's prison. Uh, I know that they were involved with the state complex and, and did good work there. They're a, a good firm. So there's no going wrong choosing them. But I, I think we all ended up feeling that the Montpelier firm was a little bit better fit for a feasibility study. Uh, you know, we're a long way from really designing anything. Yeah, they were within budget. We we gave them the budget. It's public information, and so their their budget was right in the uh, in that ballpark of the uh, the forty one thousand two hundred fifty dollars. Um, so budget is really not an issue. <coughs> um, we really were looking at qualifications. I think. Um, they're going to uh, hold a series of public meetings, or we're going to hold a series of public meetings with them. Uh, we're going to be looking at an array of different sites. We're going to narrow that down to about three sites, uh, including any available municipal sites. And they'll do a, a basic site design for those three sites. They'll look at uh, budget and uh, in terms of both uh, site development and uh, building construction budget. Uh, they'll look at potential funding sources uh, through uh, federal, state funding sources. And then they'll look at a, an operating budget uh, based on figures that uh, we'll give them, that the Senior Center and Children's Room will give them. They'll come up with some operating uh, budget so they can look at um, revenue, expenses, that type of thing. I think the other thing, too, from my point of view, that um, spoke well of GBA, and <clears throat> you might remember the exact projects, but they, they were involved in Montpelier's master planning that started 25 years ago, probably. And uh, 
I think they understand too that there are projects that are important for communities to talk about and think about and get ready for. It doesn't necessarily mean that the project is going to be built in two years, uh, that there is value in looking down the road and identifying something that might uh, fulfill a need in the community. The community might not be ready to step up to the plate yet. Um, so I don't think, from my perspective, there's going to be a lot of push from them that you have to make fast decisions and you've got to kind of get everything done immediately. That was, that was my take, that they're uh, actively involved in kind of long-term municipal planning. And I think that's the other thing. This group, to me, and I'm not familiar with them, except I know they've worked in Montpelier fairly extensively. but. Uh, they work mainly for municipal clients, I think. They're public clients, whereas Bread Loaf is, uh, you know, they're kind of an all-purpose uh, organization that works for lots of different types of uh, entities. So. Questions from the board? I was going to say, anything from the board members? Not really. I mean, the, the spend's already been approved. It's just deciding who's going to get the contract, basically, is what we're approving. Right, we, we uh, applied for the grant. Um, you know, we there was a decision to move ahead with the project. So, that's my take. Is uh, we're basically reporting out on the procurement process, and we do need um, would need you to authorize the um, the contracting with GBA architecture. I think um, we clearly want to keep all of you involved and. Um, you know, this is, um, as Bill said, there's, um, you know, it may, may be a long-term project. We don't know how this is going to evolve. That's really evolve. That's really what the study is for. Well, I hate to be a stick in the mud, but I'm, I'm going to be. Um, unfortunately, I can't approve this myself. Uh, we don't have a third a fourth person here tonight unless Jane happens to pop through the door. But I think she said she was going to be gone. Yeah, she's away. Quite honestly, um, at this time, my taxes are high enough. I, I can't justify. We've got enough on our plate that we need to deal with that are going to drive our taxes up even more for me to conscientiously participate. And don't take it personal, Steve. I don't want anybody <laughs> no, to take any of this personally. Uh, I need a new $60,000 pickup truck right now. But I'm not going to step put on a, a foot on a lot to buy one because I simply can't afford to do it. Um, the municipality, however, for whatever reason, you know, groups of people come to our, come to us and ask for things like this, and we put them in motion. And the next thing you know, I mean, if we approve this and it goes to the next step, the next thing you know, a feasibility study. And let's be honest. Feasibility study is not going to come back and say, no, you can't do this. Uh, you pay these people to figure out how to do it one way or another. Um, and it's up to the public, I guess, to decide whether or not they want to bite the apple. Um, I don't even want to entertain that option right now simply because of the other issues that we have in front of us that I feel are stronger, more important issues. Uh, and just getting a handle on on the cost of living. People aren't, you know, we all know well the issues of living in this state and the cost associated with it. Um, so again, I, I'm going to apologize for, for not uh, participating in this effort, but uh, I'm going to stick to my guns, unfortunately. I, I hear you, Chris. I think the, and that's why I asked that question earlier, is that the spend's been approved. Um, I think it's an important study because I think part of it is the tie-in with groups like the Children's Room. And, and I mean, you spoke to it a little bit. I'm not trying to bring that into the play. But like, there is a need for um, child care services in the area. And I think that Potentially, that could be part of the discussion here. I think that what we can learn from this, to me, the opportunity to deny any moving forward of the project is to learn 
from this study and see what the true cost would be, see who the players are, see what that would play, and then make the financial decision on whether or not the needs or it makes sense financially. I, we've already approved the spend. This is the decision on who gets the contract. Um, I mean, if we don't authorize this contract tonight, I think we're just gonna have to put it back on the agenda sure. for the next meeting. So, I, get that. I mean, I, I really, I, I hear you and I, and, I, and I agree that we have an affordability problem, um, but I also think that there are needs as community is looking for, especially in the senior and childcare and just community engagement and space that we don't necessarily have and I'd like to see what they come up with. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand that you say you don't want to approve the contract, but we've already approved the spend, so we'll, we'll just have to wait till the next select board meeting. I think to to move it through. Sure. I, I mean, I don't. Know. Again, you, you know, yeah. everybody has their own choice to do so, but you know, to say that if this moves forward and they come to us and say, okay, well, you've got this project and here's how you can do it doesn't need to be doesn't necessarily mean we we're going to do it right now but if we wait five years down the road what's the cost then you know uh, and for me it's I understand what you're saying Mark but when does any community stop digging their cells into a hole you know when when does a community say we need to be financially responsible and get a handle on what we got right now, take care of it, get a management plan in place moving forward. That's what we ought to be looking for. Projecting forward, how are we going to handle these other issues that we know we're going to be, go be back at the table at? Do we have the funding for that? Uh, I mean, I said once before, you talked about federal and state monies that could assist in this. I mean, it's all our money, but federal and state money is just, it's like looking through binoculars backwards. It's, it's further out. You know, it's not, not the direct impact is more spread out. Uh, and I said before from the get go, if you could guarantee that the taxpayers of this town wouldn't be on the hook for this project, I'd sign it. But um, can I? Say yeah, sure. So, you know, you've been consistent from day one on this, Chris, and I certainly respect that and understand where you're coming from. And. Um, I guess, and I, I appreciate the fact that you're in a situation right now where you have to move away from your principal in order to allow something to go forward. It's pretty clear that the board, from the beginning, has supported this project over your objection. Uh, if you vote no tonight, um, you know, I guess if you're going to vote to, no tonight, I'd, I'd rather ask you to just table it and we'll bring it back to a future meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess you get to go home and feel like you didn't uh, sell out your position. Um, looking at the, the last statement you said, and, and I appreciate, you know, taxes. I work hard to try to keep them as low as we can. But over the over my career, the town, not just the town of Waterbury, but towns in general are doing more things that they never did before. You know, recreation is a huge part of our budget now. Um, it's also generating uh, revenues that are, it's paying more, more for itself than it ever did. It's, it's not breaking even yet, but we're, we're generating revenues. And measuring the, the value to the community just by how much does the tax cost uh, I think maybe misses the point a little bit. And again, Mark kind of stole my thunder. You're talking before the meeting started about families can't find childcare. Um, I'm not saying this is going to be a childcare center and the solution for you know 150 families, but it can be part of the solution to some of the issues. And I think the the feasibility study and what we're trying to do is identify who the potential users or beneficiaries of this system, this uh, facility may be, and then figure out how we pay for it. Nobody gets a free ride, but 
just to say if taxes go up, you know, three cents because of this or 10 cents because of this, yeah, there'll be people in the community that feel they get no benefit from it. But if it helps these young families be able to live here and stay here, that 10 cents may be worth it. So if, you know, it's, it's up to you, and, and I certainly respect your philosophy, and if you think you can't vote for this, I would just maybe ask the, the board to table it for tonight as opposed to vote against it and then have somebody in the public say, well, you can't take that up again unless you have some parliamentary procedure to, you know, reconsideration or anything else. So if you're not going to vote for it, I'd just ask you to ask the board just to push it off to another meeting. Uh, can I, uh, is there any example of a feasibility study that Waterbury has done that they didn't actually follow through on a project and? Yeah. Yeah, so. we, we didn't do a, a feasibility study per se, and if I could go into my uh, files in my office, I still think I have it. We paid Phelps Engineering uh, a considerable sum of money to look at the swimming pool and its needs and to figure out a way to improve that fiberglass lining, the pump system. And, uh, you know, they did, the, they did the work probably back in, I want to say, mid-90s, 95, 96. And it was a $800,000 project at that time. And the select board said, for something that's open eight weeks a year, we just can't justify the money. We know what we need to do. And we've used that feasibility study to kind of patch things and replace pumps and replace part of the, the circulation system, but we've never addressed the, the big issue that we were asked to address. So that's one thing that I know that we didn't do. Sure. And I'm sure other communities are doing it as well. I mean, for to get into the weeds on how this is all connected in the bigger picture uh, is too difficult. Um, incurring more debt or incurring more maintenance or incurring more so-called assets. You know, I think it, the word assets is overused. It's more of a liability. My son said something about the other night there, I don't own anything. I said, trust me, son, owning anything is a liability. The way things are going. Wow. I, I mean, I I want I asked Dan Sweet the other night or the other day there how, <laughs> what it would cost me to build a hay barn just to store my hay. We talked about the size of it there. He said, "Well, it'd be a couple hundred bucks a year." Okay, yeah, fine, a couple hundred bucks to the town for this year. Probably once the state education portion got added to that, it'd be closer to 600 bucks. Uh, and then climb uphill from there. Um, so consequently, I put all my hay in my shop where my all my equipment is, and I'm just a spark away from losing it all. It's issues like that that really get under my skin, and all I'm trying to do is store some stinking hay. I understand, but you might have a completely different take on it, but if you consider the building that you're sitting in right now, yeah, we have debt, we have expenses, but this facility provides an asset for this community that's widely needed, broadly used, and uh, I think worth every cent that, that we paid for it f with our federal, our state, and our local taxes. And, it is an asset, and it's something the community gets a lot of value and use for. So, you know, does it cost money? Everything costs money to maintain, and, and did our taxes go up a little because of it? Yeah. But I think we have a much more functioning facility in town than we had before. So Absolutely. I don't, I don't disagree with that a bit. Um, again, you know, the bigger picture, it's not just... You know, this municipality, over the seven years I've been here, I've come to the realization that is run probably as effectively as 
a person could ask. I mean, yeah, there's some things that could be tweaked a little bit that might help out in, improving. Exactly. But I'm saying on a scale of 1 to 10, we're probably an 8. It's just a minuscule part of the burden that taxpayers are faced with. You know, up here at the State House is a much bigger burden along with the other issues <coughs> that people have to endure living in the state, the cost of living here. And, you know, one more raindrop in the bucket. I, I don't, yeah, again, I, I get a different view on, on how I see things, I guess. Um, I understand. And I, I, I've seen that it's forcing people out. I've seen that it's making it difficult. Uh, <laughs> trust me. Within my own household, uh, my family, uh, my mom, every, everybody from, you know. So to just take on one more, and I know it's just one more, but that's it. It's just one more. So I'm not going to belabor this issue. If you're interested in tabling it, we'll do so, and uh, we can move it forward on the next on the next uh, board meeting. But uh, I'm going to stick to my guns, and I I'm sorry. You don't have to apologize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's fine. I, I, I certainly understand, Chris. Yeah. So understand. Would somebody just make a motion to move this to? The yeah, I'll make a motion to table the authorization of the contract. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Select board items. Set the tax rate for 2019. Keeping with the theme. <clears throat> Might as well. Can I deny this, too? <laughs> <laughs> if you could, go ahead. Oh, I, man, I'm telling you. Take oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know there was two there. <clears throat> OK. Um, you've got a two-sided page there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, let me just see this for a second. That's not two-sided. I guess it's just labeled. So, on the front is my uh, my math, and on the second page is the 411 report, which is a summary of the grand list. <coughs> the municipal grand list, um, starting a couple of rows down, um, seven million five hundred and sixty-eight thousand nine hundred and sixteen dollars this year, compared to last year's seven point four six two. So it's a hundred and six thousand six eighty six higher, which is a one point four three percent increase. We budgeted for a half a percent increase. So we thought at town meeting, uh, if you look at the table in the town report, that the uh, grand list was going to be seven point five oh seven, and uh, we're we're uh, higher than that by about. $62,000. So, of course, this is 1%, so $700,568,916 is the property value in Waterbury. Um, <clears throat> we pretty much came right on target with our uh, estimate, however. The total town taxes in 2019 to be raised, 3865380 that's 12.88% higher than what we had to raise last year, $441,000. Uh, dividing what we need into our grand list or by our grand list uh, brings the necessary tax rate to just above 51 cents. So I would recommend that we set it at 51 cents. Last year, uh, required 45.38 cents. We rounded down last year to 45 cents. Uh, so the increase from the 45 cents to the 51 cents is 13.33%. So um, 
by rounding down to 51 cents, there's about $5,300 that if everything came out exactly right in the budgeting process would, would be in the hole by $5,300 at the end of the day. So that's the municipal tax rate. Going back to the top, the homestead tax rate, the non-homestead tax rate, um, which used to be called the non-residential tax rate, but they, I guess this, somebody at the tax department or the state legislature realized that there were homesteads that were not getting the homestead rate because their second homes or vacation homes were otherwise not qualified for homestead. So they, they call it homestead tax rate and non-homestead rate now as opposed to non-residential. So the homestead rate, uh, $1.68.2. The non-homestead rate, $1.6484. Um, 3.96% and 2.941% above last year's rate. Um, those are set by the state tax department using information um, uh, from the school district about per pupil spending and how that correlates to the so-called uh, state block grant. And then uh, it's also divided by our common level of appraisal. Our, our CLA, our common level of appraisal is about 96% right now. So what that means is we're 4% under being 100% fair market value. Uh, we don't have to worry about a, a reappraisal until we get below 90%, which should be a number of years yet. Dan's been doing a good job uh, kind of keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak, with regard to uh, adjusting the grand list. So anyway, um, I'm recommending that you adopt the 51 cent tax rate for the municipal um, side of the ledger sheet and then approve the uh, education tax rates. And at the very bottom, uh, we voted a number of years ago to uh, exempt up to $50,000 of property for disabled veterans. The state gives you a break on the homestead rate for up to $10,000. They allow you to go up to $50,000, but you have to pay the difference between the 10,000 and the 50,000. Um, to the Ed Fund. So in 2019, there's $827,800 worth of home uh, exemptions from taxes for disabled vets in town. That's up slightly from last year. In 2018, it was 793000 So again, doing the math, we've got a We've got to raise $13,924 this year to give to the Ed Fund. So we divide that 13924 by the grand list. So that um, exempt tax line, the fourth tax rate, if you will, is 0 0.0018. So with that, I'll let you ask any questions if you have any. At the very bottom, you can see if you prove everything that I've just um, kind of rehearsed here. The all-inclusive homestead rate would be $2.19.38, and the all-inclusive non-homestead rate would be $2.16.02. You said uh, disabled veterans, right? Yeah. Disabled vets or their uh, widows or widowers. Any questions, board? know through our budget process that uh, 
our growing grand list is kind of helping to some degree keep pace with the uh, growing costs. Well, you know, our, our budget far outpaced the grand list this year. Uh, you know, we, we need right. we need 13 percent more money this year than we needed last year on the tax basis, and 12.88 percent more last than we have. But you know, we've we've used up the surpluses that we've gained over time. We've added things, you know, we've got the full year of the state police contract. We've got $40,000 worth of ambulance uh, service in our budget this year. So, you know, that's, that's really the, the big change. If, it, if you could remove, uh, you know, if the village was still here and still had a police department and we weren't coming up with $365,000, you know, your, your tax rate would be 47 cents instead of 51 cents. But it's a service that the community was uh, educated about and chose to spend, so. Well, that's kind of to my point, and I just, I'll talk about a couple things if you don't mind. Um, it's your meeting. You just kind of, turned the light bulb on there about um, the whole ambulance thing that's as the clock ticks here that that issue of having to deal with them in a more broader sense getting closer every day uh, I'm sure uh, you know then we got the fire trucks and just all the things that all the things that are in our lap that, that we're going to have to continue to deal with is part of the reason for this last issue, uh, me not being on board with it. Um, I want to bring up a point there because it just talking about the grand list, talking about economic development, talking about how that's perceived as being our solution to everything, you know, to the governor's point of coaxing people into the state to try to help the economics here. Um, be quite honest with you, I've thought about that quite a little bit. In order to really make a difference, like some of these southern states who have huge populations, you'd have to double the population in this state in order to get any revenue impact that would be substantial to help the economics in this state. And that would, quite frankly, in my opinion, ruin the state um, a week or so ago i asked carla how the how the uh, zoning permits were coming thinking about you know what additional tax revenue might we be looking at here uh, because everybody because there is no help out there everybody's stretched to the limit everybody's working ridiculous hours must mean that and from what I know, the, all the projects that are going on, um, I was thinking that our grand list would be growing fairly larger this year than it has in the past, but Carla didn't seem to think that we were anywhere beyond what we normally were. Only in terms of the number of permits that have been submitted. Um, right. well, you know, not in terms of type of project. The, the grand list uh, increased this year. I, I didn't bring last year's sheet, but last year we were well below 1%. So the 1.4% the, the is not, you know, the really good years in the time that I've been here, you know, maybe one or two years we ever had 3%. Uh, really good years would have been like 2.25 to 2.5. Um, of late, you know, anything over over one has been been good. I mean, after we, you know, we dipped down after Irene, and then we, you know, rose up like a rocket because everybody was building things back new. But uh, you know, it's like anything: the the bigger the base gets, it's harder to get a bigger percentage increase. You know, if you're uh, yeah, a compound yeah, 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 right, exactly. yeah. Um, 
But, I mean, to, back to the governor's idea, anytime you import or have people come into the state, there's a cost that's associated with providing services to those people. That comes right off the top. You know, any, any revenue that's generated, there's a pretty good portion of that that goes towards just basic servicing of those people. Um, and then the, the net gain, I guess, um, is in, insufficient enough to really, you know, I keep hoping that maybe we're going to see a grand list here. And, and I understand the fact that we've spent more money in the last couple of years on paving than we've ever spent in the previous years. We got this new building, so and I the police. That's and the police, and I do see those things happening. Right. You know, um, well, I think that doesn't lessen the impact on on you know business folks like me, like him. I mean, we just and him, we're just we're, we're not able to raise our rates every stinking year. To try to keep pace with the the cost, the additional cost that, and it's basically coming out of our butts. <laughs> well, not not to get too far in the weeds about you know comparing us to the southern states and the like. And it's not just population, and part of it is just the governance structure that we choose and that we choose to continue with. And it it's a bear to change it, and I'm not suggesting that we change it. But you know, if you go to Georgia, where my kid live. All these recreation programs that are going on in every town that appears to be a town for us is being paid for by the county. So they're taxing all the property in the whole county, and they have a, a number of different areas. But they've got all their administration for this. You know, it'd be Montpelier, Barry, Berlin, Waterbury. They'd be one administration. They'd be 15 or 18 different sites for recreation going on, but they'd have far fewer administration people like me involved in, in running it because they're running it on a county basis. Same with fire and police for the most part. Most municipal services outside of New England are run by counties. And you give up local control that way because you don't get to design your own program as easily as we do. You have to, you know, you're sharing the the governance structure with, with other folks. So there's a lot of reasons why. But anyway, for this year, I mean, the, in the past two years, the big difference between our 43 and 44 and 45 cent tax rates that we had is the police and, and Absolutely. The, the public safety staff. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So unless the other board members have anything other further to say, we can uh, make have a motion to uh, approve the tax rates as provided for the 2019 session. I'll make the motion. I'll second that. Oh. Uh, go ahead. Okay. You've been it's been seconded. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. All those who wish to approve, say aye then. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Bill. And, yep. And in keeping with the uh, tax theme, just to make sure to bring it to me. Is that you? Um, we've got to set that uh, the late penalty for not filing homesteads. We okay. go through this every year. Yeah, yeah. Um, we would recommend that you do what you did last year. Do you have those minutes available? A motion to approve the uh, same same standards as last year. Same formula. Yeah. So the motion that Mark made last year is right there. Both. Make a motion to set the penalties at 3% and 5% as had been decided a year ago. 
I'll second. Okay. Any wish to further comment? No. Seeing uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. For Saturday, August 17th. See, that's six months away, ain't it? <laughs> um, actually, it's right around the corner. <laughs> I can't even believe we're getting close to August already. So the 15th annual 100 on 100 relay is scheduled for Saturday, August 17th. It basically runs from Somewhere in Stowe, I think, to like Mount Kimo, all along Route 100. Yeah, we're there. Um, they will be running through Waterbury. Uh, they will not require any roads to be closed. They have kept Lieutenant David White and Barb Farr in the loop. And they will go on the uh, community path to the extent that they can to stay off of Route 100. Uh, Did the board see the uh, memo that Carla sent? Attached for this relay. Okay. It's essentially it. Yeah, there's really nothing that you have to do except right. acknowledge that they're going to do it. And yep. If you have no objections, that's good enough, I think. Yep. Okay. I would. I would put in a request if they're going to use the community path that, um, in the event that when they're doing that, it's a very wet and muddy day that there be some stipulation that they go in and fix it. They said that they, um, of course, crew will ensure that each town is inspected after the end of the race. Any race material will be disposed of properly. Because I know we've been running the gravel grinder for years, and uh, there was one very, very wet year, and we went back in and fixed the community path to the best of our abilities. But we're, uh, it gets pretty beat down when it's really, really wet. So. We had no rain in a long time, so should be good. <laughs> like a week? Yeah. Five I don't know. <laughs> we, yeah. We got a couple, a couple pretty good storms there Saturday. Friday, Saturday. Okay. But other than that, I would make a motion to approve that. No, we're all set. All right, Bill. Some manager's items. Okay. Um, I'm not going to take any time to review this. Um, this is the 2017, 2017 audit from Sullivan Powers. Uh, Sullivan Powers is the auditing firm. Uh, 17 was the first year that they audited. Uh, all the years prior to that, Bill Iacoboni has done. Um, it's a very thorough audit. Uh, there's a couple of uh, management letters or uh, letters in here that uh, you probably should read. Um, there are a couple of findings. Uh, this is the first time in uh, in a long time that there's been any findings and I frankly attribute it to the fact that we're just getting used to what they're looking for. Uh, they did make some comments about internal controls and if you read that letter you'll find that you know management and the auditors didn't have any uh, disagreements so uh, their, their issue of internal controls. I asked them about it. I said, why are we getting a, uh, 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 a downgrade? Not a downgrade, but why are we getting this kind of citation that you're concerned with our internal controls explained again how we have a pretty thorough and extensive um, division duties. You know, Carla signs checks, but she, she can't print the checks. Uh, reconciling checkbooks. We, we have different people in the organization do different things. Uh, it boils down to the fact that I guess they would like it uh, more clearly written out than we have it. Uh, 
we have a big notebook that Leanne helped us put together that uh, basically uh, explains the whole financial process. <clears throat> Yakovoni helped us put that together. They would like it to be a little bit more wordy than it is, I guess. I'll let them speak for themselves. They're not going to sell it in powers. Uh, my hope to save time and, frankly, I don't want to say pain, but uh, save time and just, uh, I'll leave it at that, save time, have them come in and, and have a discussion about the 2017 and 18 audit when they finish it, rather than have them come in now and just talk about this one and then have them come in later. So. Um, the financial statements are in good shape. Um, you know, there's things that they want us to report ourselves uh, more than we did in the past, and uh, I can't I can't criticize them for it. The GASB standards, you know, the, the Government Accounting Standards Bureau, I guess it means. Um, you know, we're supposed to keep a record of our fixed assets. Um, Bill Iacoboni did that for us. He took our financial statements and when we made capital purchases of trucks or uh, did a major construction process, project, or built a building, you know, he worked with me. He took that information from the budgets and then he created the, he created the, um, the fixed asset um, schedule that we have and he worked on the depreciation. These folks say, well, the standards say you as the municipality should be keeping those records and doing that. Um, and we've just not done it in the past. So we have worked long and hard this year. We have a schedule of fixed assets now that we've built into our accounting system. That the the uh, the component, the ability to do it has been there. We've just never used that component of our accounting software. So we are doing that now. Um, I guess it gives a better picture of the, uh, you know, the bottom line of what the assets and liabilities of the municipality are, but knowing that the roundabout is a $6 million asset really doesn't change how we do business at all. Uh, and that it gets depreciated, you know, one thirty of the one thirty thirtieth of it every year gets depreciated. Um, so anyway, there's a few <laughs> things of note in here. Um, look it over. Uh, we'll have some Sullivan and Powers in after they finish the eighteen audit. You can ask your questions then. Um, and the frustration with me is, and, and I, I'm not saying this complaining at all, but. Um, this transition, unfortunately, just there's no good time to have a transition from one hour to, to the next, but that it came right when our long-term bookkeeper got done, um, and you know, we just don't have, as I've mentioned many times before, we don't have the financial departments with the staffing that many of our local neighboring towns to, you know, if you go to Stowe, they've got finance directors, they've got head bookkeepers, they, you know, they've got a, they've probably got a five or six person finance staff, same with Montpelier. We have Michelle and me and Carla to a lesser degree, and that's not a complaint, it's just a reality. So this stuff has been just taking an inordinate amount of my time, but there's nothing that can be done about it, you just gotta, gotta get it done. And, and move in that direction. So, anyway, uh, when you're done with it, if you decide that you are finished and you know you want to start a fire with it or something, give it back to us instead. <laughs> we get a little keep it on fire. Okay. So, I mean, if Bill Iacovoni had to follow the same standards, obviously hiring a new firm, they've got a prove their worthiness. Uh, I don't think it's a matter of proving their worthiness. I just think that, that um, you know, from, from 
The Iacovoni produced an audit that met the standards, and he, he helped get our books. Years ago, when I first came here, we had an income and expense report, and that was it. And he created our financial statements. And over the time that I've been here, um, at one point I sat down with him when these new GASB, it's called GASB 34 standards, were coming in. He said, you know, this is kind of, the standards are ramping up to the next level. And I worked with uh, the people at Memrick, Ernie Saunders and his staff. And uh, back around, I don't know, it was 2000, Six. When did you become a town clerk? Eight. Eight. So it was in the 2007 time frame or so. So I'd been here a number of years already. Um, sat down with those folks and said, you know, we really need to learn how to use this accounting software. I was not an accountant. I'm still not an accountant. But we we moved to the next level and we started not only having a good income and expense statement. We changed our whole chart of accounts. Uh, you can go back in time and probably in the 2000s, you'll see how we, we had two budgets. This was last year's budget, and then we reported it with, with through the end of the year. And then our whole chart of accounts and the way we presented our budget changed completely. And we started to uh, use balance sheets that we created as opposed to Yakavoni just making sure that they lined up right. So we moved to the next level and we've been doing, I think, you know, probably 90% of what we're supposed to do. But there's certain things, you know, if you read in here, uh, we have a pension liability. Now Yakavoni, if you look at his last audits, you're going to see there's a pension liability there. There's nothing we can do about it. We belong to the state, the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System, which is set up by the state legislature. It's run out of the state treasurer's office. And the state, uh, the, the state treasurer with the Beamers board sets the uh, retirement percentages that have to be contributed towards uh, you know, municipal employees retirement. We have no say. We can't. We can't increase it, we can't decrease it, we can't take any action to change it. But now these GASME standards say, you're supposed to know what your unfunded liability for pensions is. And you can find that in here. Iacovoni used to do it and find it, and he'd write it, put it in the report. You could look at it and know what it is. Nobody ever asks about it, it doesn't really mean anything. But Sullivan and Powers wants us to do it. So, we're going to have to be the ones that, you know, call the state treasurer's office, look at these different forms. It's not hard. It's just that it wasn't anything we had to do before because he did it. Now we're going to have to get there to do it. And we'll do it. It's just one more thing that we got to do. So it's, it's those little things. Um, so they're absolutely right in terms of what they're asking for. Just was a little easier before. Just Bill was a damn good guy, right? <laughs> and he charged us about a third of what they <clears throat> Again, <laughs> do I have to repeat myself? <laughs> of course, he pulled the plug on everybody there this spring, and that was uh, yeah. pretty disheartening after all those years. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Everybody's time comes. Yeah, everybody. Okay. You betcha. All right, so moving on to the next item, which is related, I lost my agenda. Uh, um, so now I would like you to authorize me to sign the engagement letter for the 2018 audit. Uh, we have started uh, gathering information and, you know, uh, doing calculations that they want us to do. Um, it's, a, it's a long letter. Um, it goes on for six or eight pages, maybe. Eight, nine pages. Basically outlines their scope of service and what they expect us to do, um, and then what they're going to do. And then it 
That is the price, which is the price they quoted a year ago when they bid on the project, uh, $22,000 for 2018, which was the same price as it was for 17. And then I think next year it will go up by $1,000 for the next three years. It was a five-year agreement. So anyway, um, you can read the letter if you want. I can send it to you electronically if you're interested. It's really pretty dry. Um, but I would ask you to authorize me to sign the uh, engagement letter with Solving Powers for the 2018 audit. Still moved. Oh, sorry. Okay. Nope. Second. Quick and easy. Uh, is there any further questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks. Review of Vermont State Police Report. July 1st, 18 through June 30th, 19. Um, <clears throat> looking at the June uh, 2019 report, uh, first, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, very similar to what uh, the last few months have looked like. And you'll notice when you looked at the report for the 12 month period, um, most of the percentages are uh, similar. Um, traffic incidents are up. They did fewer traffic stops in June than they did over the four year period, but uh, that's really the, the main difference. Um, the disputes amongst persons really isn't that much higher. It's just uh, the percentage is higher given the traffic stops uh, went down in June. And in June, they had people that were um, unavailable to, to work uh, because folks were on, on leave. Um, the year report, the July through June uh, 19 report shows that they had, there were 1,100 calls handled by Middlesex in that 12-month period, so uh, just under uh, 100 calls per month uh, on average. Um, and 54% of the calls of those 100, uh, 1,100 calls were taken by the two resident troopers that we're paying for, 46% by the Middlesex barracks uh, who are not our assigned troopers. Um, you can see on the uh, graph on page three that um, most of the time, uh, you know, they're looking in the 300 plus, to 300 to 350 hours per month. Um, you know, 80 hours a week times four weeks would be, what, 32, I mean, 320 hours um, is really 4.33 weeks per month. Um, as we moved later into the contract year, if you remember, uh, one of the troopers uh, that was assigned to us originally uh, retired at the end of December, and about that time you see that the number of hours that they worked on a monthly basis kind of trailed off a little bit. Um, they had to get the new trooper in. They had uh, one of the trooper uh, had uh, National Guard duty to do. Um, so uh, there was a spike down there between April and May, and now in uh, June it has come back up to almost 300 hours a month. And I think now that the uh, military obligation for this year is over for one of the troopers that they'll get up into that 300 to 350 
hours per week range again. Um, I don't know what feedback the board gets. Um, from my perspective, this has been working well. Uh, I don't, the trooper that, uh, that was forced to retire at the end of December, he was the most outgoing of all of them in terms of making it a point to come in here to talk to me. Uh, not that these guys aren't, but I would see him a little bit more frequently than the current folks. But that was before we had the monthly meetings set up. So I think that they're kind of uh, using that as their touch point with the community. And um, I think you went to the last meeting, didn't you? Do you remember when the next one is scheduled? I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's anyway, every other, it's every it's, other week, right? It's twice a month right now. Yeah. On a Thursday night? Oh, no, they moved it to Wednesdays now, I think, because of the concerts on Thursday. Um, I've, I've had a couple of people tell me yeah, we, we never see them out there. Uh, you know, I don't think that we're getting that money's worth because I just don't see them. But, you know, I some weeks I don't see them at all, but other weeks I see them fairly regularly. I saw somebody stopped on up the road the other day, so I, I know they're out there. So. Mm. Yeah, because at the last meeting there, I offered up, a couple of us offered up our, you know, facilities, driveways, whatever, right. for them to park, and they haven't uh, haven't taken us up on it. Um, I haven't seen them hardly at all lately, but of course, I've had my face buried in the dirt, so I don't get out much. Um, but uh, if you're saying you saw them on Guptill Road, that's that's a good thing. Um, I do know that uh, up by the town shed is still a, can be a hot spot. Um, I was coming down through the other day, and a Canadian vehicle was coming through there, and a pretty good clip. And I said, "Where's the police when you need them?" But other than that, I mean. On a quick side note, what, what happened with those so. flash? I remember we approved the, uh, the speed What's flashing. That? Yeah, the, we've filed all that paperwork with the state, and now I'm just going to wait for them wait. to yep. come up and, and do that work. And uh, whether it will be this year or next is still not completely known. But we, we did put all that stuff in and gave the approval. So it looks like in June, you know, they had 106 calls, 15% were traffic incidents. You know, so that's only a little more than 15 uh, stops in the month. So either people are being religious or they're not happen to be where the traffic incidents are. Right. I mean, as far as the nighttime issue, I mean, you're more of a night owl than the rest of us because you're businesses, but how is that? I mean, has it been working fine for you so far? Yeah, yeah. I am. Seems like no complaints, huh? I see them around, um, but yeah, no complaints so far. And Frankly, I'm, I'm shocked that there hasn't been more um, more uh, people stop for speeding, considering all the side roads people are taking to get around Main Street. Mm -hmm. um, I know the sheriff has been out on River Road quite a bit, um, and I've I've seen two or three people pulled over out there because River Road has turned into a racetrack, yeah. um, yeah. and people are and the people are taking all every side street they can and coming around the horseshoe and. Uh, but no, I, overall, I, I think they've been doing a great job. I think some of it, too, the word gets around that they're setting up speed traps, because for a while there, they were on, I've seen them on Stowe Street quite a bit, actually, and then Guptill as well, up by uh, the post office. You know, a couple tickets get thrown out in town, and a couple right. more people get pulled over for speeding, and I think the word spreads that... I didn't. I didn't. sheriff in town. <laughs> 
That's what they call a deterrent, right? <laughs> I noticed this when I was looking. You know, the June graph shows um, 106 calls, and it says traffic incidents 15%. So what's that? That's a little more than 15. Right. But on the on the chart that's on the back of the 12 month one, the blue line shows traffic stops and you know May and June it's got traffic stops ranging from you know like 35 to 60. So I'm not sure what traffic incidents mean. I can I can check with the lieutenant. I didn't happen to notice this discrepancy yeah. until right now. But looking at that, you know, they're showing that um, traffic stops are it looks mistake. like the high month was, you know, about 118 last August, and the low month was about 35. Uh, and then you can see the blue line is the stops. Uh, the orange line is motor vehicle complaints. So I, I assume that's people calling about a complaint. The gray line is tickets issued, and the yellow line is warnings issued. So. Um, <coughs> I'll, I'll talk to Lieutenant White to try to get a little bit more clarity, but um, we'll let you know. We'll try to remind ourselves what that next meeting is and let you know. Did, was there any general public there, Chris? I know the night that I was, yeah, there might the last one there was, I ended up having a meeting for Wednesday and I had a fun meeting that night. So I could, yeah. There was, uh, I think, 10 of us there, a couple, a couple different people than from before, but. Uh... Okay, thanks. Okay, and the last one, um, I'll let Carla talk about it, but the legislature, um, every so often uh, amends the, they call it the fee bill, and uh, the fees that, most of the fees that are set in the town clerk's office, that are collected in the town clerk's office, even the fees that we get to keep are set by state statute, so it's uniform across the state. So Carla can give you some information on that. So it had been like uh, over a decade since the town clerk fees had been increased. So this legislative session, uh, there was a pretty significant increase in recording fees and fees for vault time. So we should see an increase in town clerk revenues. A second thing that happened in legislature was that um, towns are now able to issue birth and death certificates for anyone in the state. Previously, I could only issue a birth certificate if the parents had lived in Waterbury when the baby was born, and I could only issue a death certificate if the person died in Waterbury. Now I can do anyone in the entire state through a new um, database that the state created. So that means like Chris Palermo can come in and get d death certificates, which he does quite often for any of the communities that he's serving, instead of having to go to each of those communities. Thanks. So there'll be a... So we'll get because all, because we'll it, all, it all just gets added to the standard data sheet for the entire state, that why? There's a new, it's called a Vital Records Information Management System. We had death records, access to death records on that system. Now we have access to birth records. You just have to type in the person's name, date of death, date of birth, up pops a certificate, and you can make a certified copy. Cool. So what, what were the recording fees and what are they now? The recording fees were 10, now they're 15. The recording fee for a property transfer tax return was 15. No, that was 10 and now it's 15. The recording fee for a mylar was 15 and now it's 25. Fault time was $2 an hour for researchers, now it's four. So and we get to, and the town gets to keep all of that? Mm -hmm. We have to put a certain amount of it aside for restoration. Right, part of the, legis yeah, part of the legislation was at least $4 of any recording fee has to be put in a restoration digitization, digitization fund. We were previously putting in three. Like a maintenance fund. Yeah, to maintain the records. Yeah. Good. Just to let you know. Any questions? All right. That. You got the antique car show and the Main Street update as well. 
Yeah, so the antique car show is going to be held Friday, August 9th through Sunday, August 11th. Uh, the main event is going to be at Forest Field down on Route 2, as it was last year. Uh, they will have a uh, uh, party, street dance, whatever you want to call it, from 4 to 9 o'clock on Saturday the 10th at the train station using both Rotarian Place and Rusty Park and Park. Uh, and then they will have Saturday afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30 uh, the, uh, the parade. Uh, I'm not sure the, the route's in here somewhere. I don't if you want me to find it, I can't. Um, they have filed all the information that they need to uh, do this. Uh, the only thing that I can see that they don't have yet is the um, public events permit from the Department of Public Safety. If you're going to have more than 2,000 people, you need a state permit. They have applied for it. All that paperwork is in. So uh, they have sent a check for $25 for us, which is our events fee. Um, and uh, I would ask that you approve the issuance of the special event permit for the Vermont Antique Classic Car Meet, sponsored by the Vermont Automobile Enthusiasts Incorporated, uh, with the uh, condition that the public safety permit from the state arrives. Are they doing a parade again? Yes. And is it the same route? I remember there was a lot of conversation because of the roundabout. I can't remember how it actually went last year. They came through the roundabout, up Union Street, over Railroad Street, then over Park Row, and then back down Main Street. So I'm not sure what the route is this year. Is that the same weekend as the Arts Fest? No. No, Arts Fest is this weekend. This weekend. This weekend. Yeah. I think it'll be right up Main Street. Was the was the Fourth of July festival the one that we were talking about? Maybe changing the location to actually on Park Row, or what was? Remember, we were talking about the whole issue with the one ways and. Yeah, they uh, they ended up using they ended up using um, Rotarian Way, and they put a they just put a barricade up and kept one one lane open. Okay. They had flag people there. It worked out fine. Okay. Uh, the parade route up Route 2 to the roundabout, down Main Street, then Park Row, Rotarian Place, Park Street, and then Main Street back to the roundabout. So they're, they're carving off the Union Street, Railroad Street part of the route. They're just going to come up Main Street, go around the park, and go back down. That's good, because then you don't have to try to take a left on Union. Right. Yeah. They're hoping for twenty to 25,000 attendees. Wow. So they're... So, they're so, hoping to have 300 cars in the parade. They didn't come close to that many people last year. So then it was a fairly good success then last year? They were happy with it. Yeah. Uh, I know they came in... Uh, you know, a week or so afterwards, and they did a kind of a critique and what they do differently and everything else. But they, they seemed happy, and we're glad to have them. Good. So if somebody would make a motion to approve the special events oh, yeah. event That's subject right. to the receipt of the uh, public safety permit. From the state. Right. Yep. So moved. I'll second. Any further discussion? I uh, don't know if I told you there, I just recently sold both the Corvettes I had. Oh, did you? I was wondering. Well, I sold them to Scott Carpenter there okay. up here at Mansfield Motors. But uh, yeah, I decided that. Uh, Were those years I saw those going online, I think maybe? What's Stingrays? Right? Yeah, Stingrays, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did they actually say I? No. No, not yet. Uh, I actually did have one point of discussion. Have they ever asked about closing down um, Stowe Street like Arts Fest does? I wonder, uh, I wonder why. I know that they used to close down in Stowe. I mean, I know that there's a lot of events that happen down there, but 
it might be fun to see that happen downtown too. And I'll, I mean, separately, I'll reach out and just ask if they, because maybe they might not know that they can do it. Okay, well, yeah. you can certainly pass that information along. Mm. But the approval. Sure, yep. The street dance, yep. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, I guess uh, we need to, t to belly up and say aye here. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Main Street update? Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't remember if I brought this up at the last meeting or not, but more for the public. Um, 51 South Main Street, the former municipal building, which the EFUD commissioners are trying to get, um, you know, leveled off and put into a parking lot soon. Um, we ran into a little bit of an unforeseen snag there. We had a, an asbestos and hazardous materials evaluation before the building uh, started to be torn down, and they found it in the glass and in the glazing and in the aluminum, uh, not the aluminum, the linoleum uh, floor tiles. Uh, they had found asbestos and lead. Um, when Deconstruct Vermont was starting to take down the roof that was over the town clerk's office and the porch on the back that stretched out over the uh, zoning and planning uh, office, not the, the planning and the uh, assessor's office, um, they actually they found some suspicious material, so they got a hold of Bill Woodruff and they had to call the state. The state came in and determined that there was asbestos in there. So we had they had to stop tearing the rest of the building down until that was removed. Unfortunately, that was found uh, in the middle of June, and when we reached out to the asbestos abatement the contractors. They do a lot of work in schools in the summer, so they weren't readily available. So they were here today. I believe the asbestos was removed completely today. And if that's the case, I will expect that Deconstruct Vermont by the end of next week will have the building down. Um, we'll get the, uh, the biggest challenge, I think, will be to knock that old ball down. And, you know, I don't know what's in there, we know it's concrete. Don't know how much rebar or whatever is in there, but it's pretty so, thick. So um, we're hoping by the end of next week that that lot will be, the building will be completely gone. The lot will be leveled, and it will be available for uh, parking to replace uh, spots being lost on Main Street. There's a meeting here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, where the town and Jay McDonald. And VTrans will be meeting with uh, business folks who have been invited. Um, the critical path for McDonald is the sewer, the, the sewer line. They've got to get that done. Um, and you know the deepest area is from right in front of the Prohibition Pig. Uh, <coughs> that's everything from the south end flows to that point, then out uh, Elm Street down into the behind the cemetery and then it gets, uh, flows over to the pump station and then gets pumped down there. And then from uh, Mark's building, his building right now, the sewage flows to Elm Street, but when the project is done from his building this way, that will flow down North Main Street. I come down Main. Uh, right now? Yeah, I go to my parking lot, I'm the only line on it all the way to a sewer right in front of Propane. Right, you come out on Main Street. But what I'm saying is that when the new project is done, your sewage will not flow down to Propane and out Elm Street. Oh, your right. sewage is going to flow this way down Main Street. Ah, okay. Turns will be taking a left, not a right. Right. <laughs> so anyway, I like um, the pitch. <laughs> at, uh, Shorter distance. <laughs> we we have. We have been uh, working with the public and businesses in particular to talk about, you know, where this project is going to be and when. And uh, if you remember McDonald, 
when they bid on the project, the state had the project starting at the roundabout and basically parading down Main Street four times in two years. Uh, and McDonald said, we don't want to do that. State. <laughs> they wanted to start at segments three and four at the south end, do all that work, and then they were planning to be up into the Pro Pig area sometime mid-August is what uh, we had thought. A couple of weeks ago at a, at a weekly construction meeting, they talked about the schedule and lo and behold, they wanna, they're going to be starting work on the sewers of the storm drains on Elm Street here at the end of this month, middle to end of July. And then they wanted to come up starting in Main Street in the end of July. And we said, geez, you know, two problems with that. One, we've heard from the businesses, especially the restaurants, that you know, July and August are their big months. And two, if you do that, we're going to kind of lose credibility because we've been telling everybody it's going to be August before they get there. So uh, they went back to the drawing board, and uh, we'll have a meeting tomorrow. I don't know if you're coming, yeah, I'll but, come. uh, and you'll get more information about this. But um, they've sought a compromise, and, and we're going to honor it. So when they finish the storm drain work, which is on Randall and Elm, and then they have to start work on the sewers in segment two, which is right there in front of. Segment two goes from, I think, Stowe Street to um, Park. Uh, Park, Rusty Parker Park is segment two. Uh, rather than come all the way back to Elm Street and start, they're going to start at Foundry Street in front of the municipal building and work south. So. They, they will eventually have to get back into Main Street in front of the Pro Pig, but it will, be, it will be later in the summer or early fall. They'll start at uh, 51 South Main, and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to you know, get this asbestos thing out of the way to get that building going and be able to use that for parking. So you'll hear more details tomorrow, but that's kind of the game plan for right now. So with that being said, how does that affect the car show's parade? Are they going to be? They, the contractor knows about the car, the car show just as they knew about the not quite Independence Day. And uh, they will make provisions. They don't work on weekends. Uh, they've been told, you know. And the car show folks have been told, uh, you might be driving on gravel. You know, we can't guarantee everything is going to be paved and if you've got a car that you don't want to drive right. on gravel then right. don't go in the parade yep. you know, just go to fires field and leave it there but uh, anyway so that's it okay any questions comments motion to adjourn I'll make a motion to adjourn Second. all in favor Aye. Thank you all. Thank you.